Yes, so I am first man Rastafari living here in the tropical island of Jamaica. You're going to be having a very special wake and bake moment with Captain Huta right there in your homes. Yeah, man, take care of Captain Huta and give it to the world as best as you can. It's Captain Huda. everyone Uder here do you know where here is this is where here is we are about to get our mushrooms on oh my goodness What an incredible show we have for you today, kids. I am thrilled to be interviewing Ian Bollinger, one of the co-founders of the Psilocybin Cup. I wonder if he tested any mushrooms like these before. Whoa. I think we're about to have a very good time, boys and girls. Oh, let's breathe. Give me those spores. Get high today, kids. Woo! Getting some big dose of spores. Oh my goodness. Here we go. We're about to lift off. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. oh, this is going to be good. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here, once again, high and alive and tripping hard today. I am so jazzed. I am thrilled today to have one of the true real leaders in the psychedelic revolution going on in the world right now. One of the co-founders and uh, uh, creators of uh, the psilocybin cup. And it is uh, an honor to have you here today. Ian Bollinger, how are you, sir? I am humbled and thankful to be here. I appreciate you, Captain. I appreciate you having me. And I'm always here to talk, and it, oh. especially when the conversation's juicy. And oh. if I can smoke while I'm doing it, all the better. Actually, it's mandatory. I'm thrilled that you uh, you won't you won't require us to have to send the security guards in to make you smoke. That's wonderful. Oh what? no, you can twist my arm. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> what are you smoking today? Um, so I've got some from NorCal, a couple of homegrown sativas. I'm always more of a sativa person. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always had a lot of. Um, Personally, I've had a lot of paranoia in my own life, and I have found sativas actually allow me to face that paranoia because sativas tend to make you a little bit more paranoid and just be like, 
it's just nothing don't yeah. worry about it it's like you it's like coming through the other side for me and it also allows me to stay focused i have adhd you know i can stay on my tasks get things done and still feel high energy when i go play disc golf oh that's fantastic uh, on a couple of different reasons uh one of them uh is the fact that uh very surprisingly i was today playing on the oculus rift something that mm. is called a uh, uh, ninja ninja disc uh and okay and it is basically disc golf but inside an old okay. Asian japanese uh background and uh you, you throw instead of hitting the 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 chain uh, uh finish that you have for the holes here you have to hit a dragon and when you hit the dragon the dragon okay. comes alive it's interesting it's I'll interesting I'll, I'll send you some clips is it's, it on oculus rift okay yeah, yeah yes. okay i got it yeah uh, so soon to be on the new apple uh one i'm sure mm -hmm. when, uh, as soon as that comes when out. it happens yeah 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 exactly so i have a you know i i was looking around and i had a chance to come across the psilocybin cup and uh, mm. I saw that you were doing, you know, you have two of these a year. And I saw that mm -hmm. you had published some results. And uh, yep. I will, on, on the final edit, I'll be putting some of those images up here so people can see them. But I was sure. fascinated by, um, by, by all of it. And most of all <laughs> was uh, the, the discussion about trip, tryptophan. Is that the correct uh, Tryptamines, tryptamines is tryptamines. the term that we can use to broadly describe it. They're all from tryptophan, though. You're absolutely right. Okay, fantastic. And and the how you know because I would have never known until I saw that that spreadsheet how somebody would even go about judging this. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about how you came up with this and the format of of how we went about doing it and and just let everybody know what this is really all about. Sure, I'll try not to ramble too much on tangents, um, but I'll try to stay on topic. The idea being the origins of how testing for the psilocybin cup came around. So um, my partner, Reggie, who's, um, uh, we met at a, one of the early decriminalized nature Oakland meetings, like back when it was just decriminalized nature, before there was national, before there was anything, it was just decriminalized nature. And it was based in Oakland. Um, we went to a fundraiser separately, met there, and he had this idea as like cultivators have all these questions, are caps more potent than stems? Is this one cultivar more potent than this other cultivar? And it was all just hearsay. And he's like, I want data. I want to produce, I want people that will help me produce data. And I was like, I can do that. It's like, and as a person that has great confidence in their ability to do scientific work, um, I am a, a college trained, bio, trained biologist, worked in the cannabis industry and microbiological testing, DNA testing and stuff like that. Um, but I also picked up a little bit around um, HPLC potency testing in cannabis. And mm -hmm. I, I knew myself well enough and I knew scientific uh, documentation well enough that I could, if I was given a runway, I could reproduce scientific results. I knew I had that much faith in myself. Mm -hmm. So it was just hard to convince somebody that they should give you a twenty-five dollars to $50,000 instrument and free two to three months time to work on it to make something happen. Reggie did. Um, uh, he showed up, he had an instrument, he had samples and he's like, I want to know how this works. And I was like, okay, well, let's work it out. And we did free testing for the community. We did two different waves of testing originally for the community, mm -hmm. um, testing psilocybin and psilocin potency. And that was where we were like, okay, cause you know, people talk about cannabis. They talk about THC. They talk about CBD. They talk about the high times cannabis cup, the original cannabis cup and how it's all yep. about THC potency. Um, and one of the most important lessons coming from cannabis into this new psychedelic space was what are some lessons from cannabis that we didn't need to reproduce? Mm -hmm. um, and one of those lessons was the race to the top for THC. So my question, one of my big questions is, is what biodiversity is lost because some plants in the high times cannabis cup didn't have high THC content? Like what terpenes are no longer being produced? What other cannabinoids are not being produced anymore? Because those genetics just weren't sought after because they weren't the, the ones desired at the top of the list, first place, second place, third place. Right. 
And so that was a lesson that informed the decisions around, let's not make it just one compound. Like people talk about the, I hate this word because I don't think it's accurate, the entourage effect, okay. um, like how they're like THC is the VIP and all the other guys are just along for the ride. <laughs> I much prefer the ensemble effect okay. because you have like Vivaldi's spring, you need the cello, the violin and the viola all to come together. Very slightly different, but still fundamentally the same instruments to produce the power of Vivaldi's spring. You could take one out and it'll hit, but it won't hit the same, right. you know? The same is true of these cannabinoids. And I think the same is true of all these different tryptamines. So I, I actually, people use the entourage effect, that's fine. I've been fighting against it for, for almost a decade now um, because I think that it's a misnomer I think there are better choices of words. However, I understand um, that that, I like that people choose the words they like. I, I, like I, I want to push it out there. I appreciate it. I, yeah, use I'll, it, please. I'll take it, run that. with it. I'll work with that. Yep. <laughs> um, that being said, um, trying to understand that there's more than one compound. And so we expanded beyond psilocybin because honestly, when you look at the psychedelic experience, psilocybin is not actively causing you to have an experience. It's gets metabolized by your enzymes in your body into psilocin, which okay. is the active drug which makes you have the psychedelic experience. Okay. So the thing is, is we can look at psilocybin it, in that whole process of eating it and then having to get digested and then turning into psilocin. Mm -hmm. We could look at that as kind of like a time release and that's why the psilocybin experience is so long. Like eating mm -hmm. psychedelic mushrooms is so long is because you're digesting the psilocybin and getting a slow drip of psilocin over time. Right. right. And, the, and so if we think about psilocybin, how much psilocybin is present, that's kind of like duration is gonna impact or, 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 long, or length of the experience. Okay. Now psilocin, if you have psilocin in there, which you have both, present in an actual mushroom, mm -hmm. that stuff is going to go as soon as you digest it straight into your blood, straight to your brain. And it's going to, so that is like speed and onset. So mm -hmm. you've maybe heard of lemon tech or yes. maybe um, uh, doing tea for mushrooms. Oh, yes. Those are basically pre-digestions. So the lemon tech is using um, uh, the citric acid, the acidity of the, the lemon to actually pre-digest the psilocybin into psilocin. And the tea is using more of heat to do that. Okay. Um, and that's, those are two methods where if you do, if you can imagine, um, so there's a graph and this is time and this is experience. Okay. So if you have just a normal mushroom experience, it's going to be kind of like up and kind of down. But if you do a tea with the same mushrooms, it's actually going to hit you quicker, peak higher, but be shorter. Oh, because okay. there's the you're converting the psilocybin into psilocin, so you're having a much quicker speed and onset. Onset, got it. Okay, that's cool. And so that's so it's you know. hitting you faster. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's an understanding of piece of harm reduction, hopefully for people to understand. But if you want to have less time and maybe a more intense experience, teas and lemon text will produce that versus just eating the mushroom, which is going to be a much longer experience and probably a lot more mellow than mm -hmm. if you did the pre-digestion. Right. So that being said, that's just those two compounds, psilocybin and psilocin as tryptamines. Mm -hmm. There's a swath of other ones that we want to look at as well, most of which are actually fairly understudied and we don't really understand what they do to the experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I noticed when you were judging, you had, you, you, I think you had four different, wasn't there four different uh, sections where you had an actual scale of you, where you were uh, getting a chemical and you were talking about the device uh, that your partner get. What exactly was that device? Can you describe that so a little bit? The instruments, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a scientific analytical instrument called a high performance liquid chromatograph or Ooh. HPLC for mm -hmm. short. And so what it does is it allows us to take a liquid sample. And if you can imagine, have you ever been on a lazy river at like a mm. water park? Oh yeah. How it's like, yeah. So if you can imagine, like, let's say you're in an inner tube and I'm just in the water, okay? We mm. both get in at the same point. And as we're floating down, you're gonna bump into other inner tubes and other, other people. Me, I'm gonna slip in between everybody and get out before you do. So, 
a HPLC is kind of like that. It's a solvent river, okay? Okay. That I'm gonna inject my sample into, okay? And as that sample has all these different compounds in it, it stays together. But then it hits this filter that's gonna, it's gonna separate things out by specific chemistries. You can do size-based chemistry. You can do uh, chemical interaction-based chemistry. There's different ways. Right. But in this instance, where that, that filter is gonna separate out all of the different tryptamines and then it's gonna hit a detector. So it's like if there was a person at the end counting everybody that comes off. Oh, perfect. Like, okay, here, here's, here's a, a no inner tube. Here's two inner tube people. Here's three inner tube people. You know, it's like you can count those people. It's like that. And mm -hmm. we're having a detector which counts those as they come off. And that allows us to say with known concentrations. So I'll inject a standard mix that has known concentrations of standard in it. Okay. That standard mix goes through the system and then comes off separated. And I get signal for that. So I have data for that standard mix. If I get that in multiple different concentrations going down, I know a range that I can then say, okay, if my sample shows up in this range, I can tell you mathematically how much is present in that sample. Wow. You know, I, I noticed also on your, on your list, I, I was looking through all of the different names of the different types mm -hmm. of mushroom samples that you have. And the one that mm -hmm. I saw probably the most prevalent was uh, penis envy, but... I saw a ton of things that I had never seen before at all um, that was very unique. Trust me. Trust me. But I, I had actually never, until the first psilocybin cup, I had never actually handled the Enigma um, phenotype with okay. a body morph Enigma mushroom. I'm not, are you familiar with those? Uh, not, not that one, no. But okay, I would recommend um, as, as in the editing on the back end, like go Googling up the Enigma mushroom body type. Okay. It looks like brain coral. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful, but I'd never seen it before. It doesn't produce spores. It's actually just like a surface level, I call it a surface level sclerotia. It's like the transition from fruiting body into like sclerotia, which are hyphal knots, subterranean, mm -hmm. um, versus this is on the surface of your substrate. I and mean, it looks like, again, brain coral. It's like, inter it's beautiful. I recommend looking at it. Oh, that God. being said, I had never seen that before until the psilocybin cup. Um, since then, we've seen a large influx of it. And I will state to the penis envy statement, we have a kind of a bias in the psilocybin cup in the sense that people want to submit, even though we're still trying to avoid the conversation about who has the most potent, people are still trying to submit the most potent. Right. Um, in, in that way, that's what a lot of cultivators are cultivating penis envy because anecdotally, people have always said penis envy are going to be the most potent mushrooms. And honestly, I'm not going to lie, data points to it right now. I'm actually putting together some data graphics, mm -hmm. um, looking at specific lineages um, and saying, okay, this is the expected potency if you have this G, if this is your lineage. You know, if, like if you're strictly just penis envy, like just, or if you're albino penis envy, or right. if you're an albino penis envy cross, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to look at all of those things. Do you see us getting so, to a place where we're, we're going to be like, like your sativa, where you're looking for, you know, a narrow leaf that's going to give you lots of energy and give you tons of creative creativity, but then there's focused creativity and then there's scattered creativity right yep and those are like the, mm -hmm. the two differentiations there uh are, do you see us getting into that that with the the mushrooms so that we're going to be able to pinpoint uh to that kind of specificity i hope so um do i i think we are on the path there and i would hope to start because of the conversations that you and I are having right now, which is the mm -hmm. purpose of what we do the cup for, is mm -hmm. to bring the conversations to the forefront. I'm not saying we're right about where it is we wanna go with things, but right. I do wanna say it's a, a starting point. It's sure. at least a place for us to have the conversation and point us towards what we would like. I think what you're proposing is exactly what we would like to see happen. Mm -hmm. But again, like I had said, um, the other uh, four tryptamines that we did this past cup are very understudied. Um, we kind of have hypotheticals as to what they might impact in that space. So um, there are studies done with baocystin. So, okay, so like you have psilocybin. Yes. Psilocybin is to psilocin as baocystin is to norcilocin. Okay. So psilocybin gets digested into psilocin, nor baocystin, I mean, baocystin gets 
uh, digested into norcillicin. Okay. And where will we find uh, norcillicin? Where will we be? So in mushrooms, mushrooms have both baocystin, norcillicin, psilocybin, and psilocin. Ah, it have, okay. has all of those mushrooms present in a mushroom and in different amounts. The thing is, is like they've given mice pure baocystin. Um, which is the, the, it's basically the difference between it and psilocybin is a carbon and two hydrogens. That's it. That's the only difference. Okay. And it, the mice do not have that head twitch effect that is typical of psychedelics. Like if you give it LSD, it's going to have a head twitch. If you get psilocybin, it's going to have a head twitch. You know, it's like, those are symbolic of, uh, mice experiencing that. There are psychonauts, people that I know who have said, I've ingested baocystin and I have not felt any uh, physical psychedelic experience, but their mood was increased. Um, and honestly, I think that that might have an impact because again, these compounds, these tryptamines mm -hmm. are all affecting the same serotonergic or serotonin Right. Um, neuron based systems that we're working with. Yeah. And so because we're trying to look at these compounds in that way, we also need to not just look at the brain, where there's a lot of serotonin receptors, 5-HT receptors, but we also need to look at where else in the body there are. What's the second brain? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The gut, <clears throat> the gut, like that's our second brain right there. And because it's our second brain, that's one of the things I think that we need to not neglect. Is Baocystin helping us maybe get over some of that stomach issue that some mushrooms make us feel? Mm -hmm. Like is large amounts of Baocystin gonna help you feel better mood wise? Maybe give you a better experience? You know, and then there's, so we talk about serotonin, which is 5-HT, okay? For 5-hydroxytryptamine. Right. Well, there's also a, a um, psilocin like compound that exists in mushrooms that is quantifiable and present um that is called 4-HT or 4-hydroxytryptamine so if serotonin is a mood receptor like high levels of serotonin tend to increase one's mood do high levels of norbeocystin and 4-HT also increase mood what about high levels of baocystin and norcillicin do they also increase mood are they affecting our stomach we don't know but there's open space for us to trace how much is there quantify it and have people's anecdotal experiences maybe tied to it as a research point like oh well there's anecdotal evidence around wood lovers paralysis are you familiar with this i am the idea is that people that would consume mushrooms that typically grow on wood psilocybe azurescence psilocybe um sub -arginescence. like in australia i have a friend uh kane barlow who's actively trying to investigate this um in tasmania um the idea that uh, the idea of being wood lovers paralysis and the source of it so there is a compound that is found in originally isolated from a mushroom species called Inocybe eruginescens. It is, um, it is a, a fruiting body style mushroom, a basidiocarp. Uh, it is um, definitely interesting in the sense that it's related to psilocybe, um, but it also um, has the compound eruginescen, which, so if the technical term for psilocybin Mm -hmm. is 4 phosphoryl oxy dimethyltryptamine or 4 PO DMT okay i'll okay. use that one so and so aruginacin is 4 PO TMT instead of dimethyltryptamine trimethyltryptamine okay and that compound, that trimethylation, um, is found in wood lovers. Um, it's found in trace amounts in in psilocybe. It's there. I've I've seen it in some psilocybe. Um, I've definitely seen it in um, extracts where it, you know people concentrate things up, and so you're going to see um, higher amounts of it. Uh, that compound is assumed to play a role in wood lovers paralysis, possibly binding to serotonin receptors in skeletal muscle tissue, causing an in immobility in some capacities. Mm 
-hmm. Now, these things I've talked about, whether they be high levels of these tryptamines that we don't know about, that could cause better moods or better stomach conditions, or maybe decreased moods, decreased stomach conditions, or aruginacin, which is being investigated for the possibility of immobility. Like some people would look at those things as bugs, and I might actually try to look at them as features. So um, I don't know, are, are you familiar with salvia and, and people that smoke salvia? No. There are some pretty heinous videos of people that smoke salvia, like concentrates of salvia, mm -hmm. and like try to escape out of rooms and things like that. <laughs> like they're just not in this reality, but yeah. they're acting in this reality. Mm -hmm. So my thought is, is like, if I'm in another dimension, I really don't want to be moving in this one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that immobility might be a, a, a feature that might be used in the right setting in a good way. So oh, these are things I think we should highlight as how we judged um, the cup was very much, we looked at um, two different major categories, if you will. The okay. two major categories were situated in unique profiles, like unique tryptamine profiles, and then also total total tryptamine content. Okay, yes. So um, the tryptamine profile, so we looked at every, every single one of, this year we looked at every single um, mushroom that was the highest producing for a specific tryptamine. If you were the highest producing mushroom for aruginacin, you were the aruginacin champ. Okay. If you were the highest producing baocystin mushroom, you were the baocystin champ. And for, so we had six champions in that space for okay. the six different tryptamines that we looked at. Then we also had the, the categories of spiritual champions, therapeutic champions, recreational slash outdoors champions mm -hmm. and microdose champions. Yeah. And the reason for that was this idea of taking this first place, second place, third place focus of the high times cannabis cup that I had mentioned before right. and trying to flip it on its side and yeah. be like, it's not about the top of a list. It's a spectrum. And in this spectrum exists tons of different uses. Like if you want to get into an exploratory dose, I'm not going to hand you a penis envy. Right. It's, it doesn't make sense. Like, if because a because penis and beef, according to our, our, our scale, typically tests in the recreational all the way up to the therapeutic spiritual. Like, yeah. that's typically the range that you'd expect to see a penis envy in. And so, in that way, and they're variable. Like, you have some penis envies that test lower, some that test higher. So, that's also something else that we want. We don't want to hand somebody something that's very wildly variable depending on cultivator and substrate we want to hand somebody that's exploring the space or getting into microdosing um something that's refined very much regulated i mean as far as its potency levels like it's it's not going to have a variable amount so we figure that if you're going to take a microdose you should get one milligram of total tryptamines. That's kind of like the idea that we put in stone. We get that number from Johns Hopkins studies. So okay. according to Johns Hopkins studies, uh, uh, they say a 70 kilogram person, which is like 155, 165, actually, no, wait, 175 pounds. I'm bad okay. with kilograms to pounds. That's but okay. a 70 kilogram person um, should get 25 to 35 milligrams of pure psilocybin is a, a deeply therapeutic experience yeah. okay that's what they've used in their in their study so 25 to 35 milligrams so if we think about how many grams of mushrooms um we want to take to get to those numbers according to paul stamets numbers um back in the 90s which is what they based their research on that's somewhere about 3.5 grams okay. or five grams like if you think about um 0 0.6 percent uh dry weight so if you have five grams at 0 0.6 percent that equals 30 milligrams okay that dose that that johns hopkins targeted and so we thought okay if you just want to get into things we're going to literally start you at one milligram that's like the entry point and right. so that's what we targeted microdosing champ as the people that could hit that that mark as close as possible <laughs> And so we did that, but when we noticed that it wasn't just one person, um, uh, one of our scientists, Emily, uh, uh, Emily Savage, she recommended, she's like, why does there have to be just one champion? And I was just like, 
That's right. The point is to highlight the community and to show the people that are doing the good work. So we picked the two champions that flanked it the best, you know, or were on it and the one the closest to it. Those were how we chose the champions in each category. So we could highlight the people doing the good work. So we had our two microdosing champs whose total tryptamines were five milligrams per gram and were very, very tightly together. Mm -hmm. And then we were looking at recreational dose. Well, if you want to make a recreational dose, you want to get something that's going to allow you to interact with the outer world, but not be overwhelmed by it. And so we were thinking, okay, within that space, somewhere in the realm of about 10 milligrams per gram would be the optimal dose. So if I took, you know, um, two grams, you know, a two gram dose of 10 milligrams, that's 20 milligrams of psilocybin. Okay. I can imagine that's going to be well within a th above a threshold, but not overwhelming. Great for Coachella, Electric Forest, Grateful Dead kind of a thing. You know, it's like that's the space that I think that would be accessible. Dude, trust me, I'm seeing Den Company in Denver uh, next month. I'm excited. Oh, God, that's um, fantastic. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm hashtag blessed. Hashtag yes. blessed. Yeah. Um, hashtag. <laughs> uh, that being said, um, the idea is that. Uh, I really feel like that there's conversations to be had about how we look at these dosing. So at the, the we originally had spiritual therapeutic as one category. Okay. Um, and I was talking to a therapist who's like, no, those should be two different categories because in a therapeutic category, you can still engage with a therapist right. in a spiritual space. Like you're deep, deep. You're not talking <laughs> to anybody. Like you're in the, you're talking to the universe at that point, you know? Um, and so I was told that we should consider making that division. So we did. And then furthermore, it's like anything beyond spiritual, you're like deeply introspective. And at that point, you know, that's kind of the takeaway of where we wanted to place things. So it was five milligrams for recreational. I mean, sorry, five milligrams for microdosing, 10 milligrams for recreational, 15 for therapeutic, and then 20 was kind of like the spiritual, deeply introspective range. Yeah. Um, we've seen from the first psilocybin cup mushrooms test way above that. Um, but right now for the what we saw of the entire cup, we didn't see anything test over uh, 20 milligrams per gram total. Wow. So in that we have seen them test that way before, but this cup we did not. We did see some higher potency numbers um, than what we saw total wise last fall, but we did not see like highest psilocybin. We saw um, nobody breached the higher psilocybin watermark set last spring, I mean, last fall. So we're looking for to maybe some interesting uh, attempts this this fall as well, but uh, I was ranting for a minute. I apologize. That was a no, no, no. answer to your question. I'm sure. No, that, more. no, that's fantastic. No, that's great. Now, are you all of the entrants that came in were all from the San Francisco, uh, Oakland area, or did you have people coming from? No, we had international samples. Yes. Like we had, we had international samples come in. I believe we had UK, Amsterdam. Um, we had samples uh, come in from uh, that were uh, different species. We had non psilocybe cubensis. We had psilocybe natalensis. Um, mm. We had some psilocybe mexicana. We had some uh, Amer North American land race species. We had some Central American land race species. So we're definitely seeing a very unique and wide variety. You know about the story in Amsterdam where they, uh, you know, they they gave up selling the uh, dried uh, mushrooms and they sell truffles. Yeah, the truffles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, can you tell me what you think about truffles and, you know, how, what, what's your recommendations there for people that might be? So selling? I have not had a lot of personal experience with ingesting them. I've had them one time and I didn't feel anything from them. Um that being said, I'm also highly stimulated by tons of different things at any given time. So maybe I just didn't get a high <laughs> enough dose. Or, there are different things. Um, that being said, um, I find them extremely hard to homogenize, like to, to really like if I'm going to like try to make a tea with it or if I'm going to try to maybe test it. It's extremely hard to homogenize. It actually is kind of um, moist still, yes. which is not very helpful. You got to really dry it out a lot to really get to where you to really powderize. Um, honestly, the best method for it is to freeze dry it. In my experience, honestly, the best method for homogenizing any mushroom is to freeze dry. Sorry, my cat is mm, getting no, all up in the ways. That's fine. Um, uh, but I think that uh, it's difficult to homogenize. And honestly, it's what I've been able to test have not been as potent as fruiting bodies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were talking about freeze drying as opposed to 
uh, dehumidification, which yeah, like heat drying. Yeah. Okay. So freeze drying is your preferred. I would say if you want to preserve the most stuff in it, because water is the biggest enemy to both um, the compounds of interest as well as to the fruiting body itself, because if there's moisture, it can get uh, degraded by bacteria or other fungi. Mm -hmm. And so freeze drying and storing your sample um, in a nice, in a, honestly, if you could, optimal conditions, like dream conditions would be freeze dry your sample stored in nitrogen or some oh. other inert gas. <laughs> that would be optimal. That would be optimal kind of storage conditions. Oh, um, awesome. But most people couldn't do that. So I would tell you to, you know, store it into maybe um, vacuum seal, but even vacuum sealing because a freeze dried could crush a little bit. So it comes down to really what you're trying to, to do with it. I tell you to freeze dry, homogenize, and then work with it. Like at that, at that point, like do your tea or do your extract or do whatever you're planning on doing with it. You were, you were I would not freeze dry and store it long term. Yeah, uh, okay. No, yeah, long term is not a, a good maybe answer it for... might, it might, maybe with a desiccant or something like that in the jar. Maybe that would actually be a decent way to stay store it. Okay. Like, because you just want to, because if it's, have you ever heard of biocharcoal? Uh, no, no, Fair. I'm just, um, I'm just starting to, I've been learning more because I've been watching uh, one of your sponsors, uh, the Hate Street Shroom, Shroom Shop. Shop. Yeah fantastic been watching his videos and fell in love with mm. watching and watching him explore over in golden gate park and stuff and it's just mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know and actually i believe that is how it eventually led me over to you uh so that was a mm. a, a wonderful nice. little referral through that you know i was going to ask you is is there any um like in cannabis you know there's uh, there's superstar growers like burner and like uh, soma in amsterdam and there's all of these different you know names are there names already developing you know superstars that are already developing in the psilocybin industry so i i know you're asking one question but i'm going to try to answer two questions with that if that's okay both oh, cultivators <laughs> and cultivars Okay. Would that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So, cultivate, cultivate tours. Yeah, no, there are a number of people out here hustling and making names for themselves in some very powerful ways. Um, I would honestly tell people to check out the champions list. Um, yes. There are some people on there from Silly Simon last year to, um, as well as um, uh, Miss Vicious last year to this year's um, champions uh, from, oh gosh dang it, I don't have the list in front of me. Um, I'll tell you some of the cultivars that I know for a fact. Um, Bodega Bay Boomers um, was one of the people that I believe was a champion. Actually, I apologize. Uh, let me pull up my champions list because I yeah. need to have Mycelia ne Network, Purple Mystic Myco. Those are some folks that are doing really well for themselves. Mycochondria, the Trip Team fam was actually the people that submitted the uh, Paniolis Cyanessens, wow. which is actually um, the highest known a producer for, um, oops, sorry. Uh, I'm just going over to my tables right quick. Uh, highest known producer for um, Silicon. And so it's like, we have groups like the Psy Team United, like I said, Bodega Bay Boomers. Those are some people doing really well for themselves, um, as well as people that have produced some pretty interesting folks. Um, there's been Doma, um, the Magic Myco fam, they've been producing some very interesting genetics. Wumbo Myco has been producing some interesting genetics. Um, so there's been tons of people within the community that have been just like showing up and just like um, just blowing everybody's socks off with offerings as well as education, as well as, you know, just resources. So okay. I know that there's so many different people doing work. I, I mean, there were people that submitted in almost every cup. There have been people that have been all throughout the list. Um, there are people that have been really, really scoring well and high in the stuff that they've been producing. So it's just, there's been a lot of work in cultivars. I can honestly say Tidal Wave has been recently one of those ones that has had a surge because I the saw first that cup. Um, Enigma, the, 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 the blob, as it's been termed, um, has been one of the ones that's had a lot of controversy around it, but also seen a lot of growth recently. Um, Hillbilly this past year has seen a lot of, it's a big producer. Um, it produces lots of big fruits, um, tests very, very uh, consistently, and is 
it's fairly easy to work with um, versus Enigma, which is very difficult to work with, but is a high producer. Um, basically, I can tell you, like, if you're trying to hit the top of the charts, you're always going to be looking at the albino penis envy lineage. Um, we saw a very large number of Melmac this year, which if you're a fan of ALF, as I've recently learned, it's actually uh, <laughs> coming from his home planet. I didn't realize that that was the connection. <laughs> Love it. it makes me so happy um alien life form you know it makes perfect sense that's what they are um that being said we had a lot of um uh golden teachers come in from the yeti ghost kind of lineage you know the mm -hmm. true albino, albino golden teachers those guys were scoring very much within the recreational um uh, range so i wholeheartedly recommend people check out those golden teachers are definitely one of the best burmas from microdosing have been amazing um both in their consistency as well as their availability um so there's just been a lot of work coming out of uh, the community trying sure. to produce things that are more targeted and that's one of the things that i liked about the highlighting of the spectrum it's like mm -hmm. just because you don't have the highest so that's honestly a thing so one of the unique profiles is like the highest um aruginacin um, producing mushroom was actually one of the lowest producing mushrooms in total. That would have been lost Whoa. if we had just done first, second, and third list. Like that would have just been completely forgotten about. And it highlights what we're trying to do with this system. It's trying to bring the conversation to not just single compound, not just single use. We're not just here to get blasted. I mean, you started this conversation with what are you smoking? And I gave you a whole rant as to not just what, but why. You mm -hmm. asked me about profiles and whether or not we're gonna get to that space. It's like, we're on that path and I'm hopeful. That's literally the, the road I'm trying to help pay pave but you can't force people to walk down roads you can only just pave it and and provide the opportunity and right. that's what i hope conversations like this are are inspirations yeah. in that way absolutely absolutely what about um uh digestion methods uh i was in jamaica not long ago and they had something i had that i'd never seen before they have shroom shine so uh, uh, two grams of golden uh, golden uh teacher ground up inside uh a uh, high proof, uh, overproof white rum, uh, marinated mm -hmm. a couple of nights, and then you could you could dose it, right? And they were, mm -hmm. you know, just, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, I was I was rather surprised. Um, didn't have a lot of the the normal cramping that that I would have, you know, the uh, stomach cramping. Yep. And and had a, a grand old time. And I'm surprised I haven't seen anything like that around. And I'm not even sure if that's mm. a, a good thing because I'd only ever seen it there. And there's so many others, uh, uh, candies and, and goodies and stuff like that. How do you feel about all these other kind of methods that are, that are now popping up? I have uh, a lot of different perspectives on it. So I'm gonna have to put on some different hats to really have that conversation. Okay. So just as a consumer hat, um, Polydrugging is what I call uh, anytime you take more than one um, kind of drug in this way. Alcohol mm -hmm. undoubtedly is a drug. So yeah. alcohol plus psilocybin or all of these other tryptamines that get extracted in an alcohol extract um, are definitely things that are, they're, they're gonna affect. So psilocybin and tryptamines are gonna affect you one way according to your body chemistry. And then alcohol is going to affect you another way, according to your body chemistry. And so now you're you're not just dialing one thing. So I think the brain is a transceiver. It sends and receives chemical signals. Okay, okay. and we adjust those chemical signals by adjusting our biochemistry. So if we take in alcohol, we're we're numbing things. We're turning things down a little bit. You know, that's what these kind of you know benzodiazepines, you know, these depressants do. They turn things down. Our, our response times, everything. But now when we're talking about psilocybin, we're also tuning it to a different frequency. So we're not just like dimming the screen's brightness. Mm -hmm. We're also going in between channels. And so now it's not just one signal coming in. It's a couple of different signals that now we're like our reaction time, our judgment is being mixed. So it's like dosing those things appropriately for an individual, mm -hmm. it's more difficult. Don't get me wrong, I think that there is a use for it. 
I think that there is a use for anything. I don't want to ever tell a person not to do something. My stance when it comes to any of these things, uh, psychedelics as a whole, come, I comes from Lorenzo Haggerty from the Psychedelic Salon. Um, mm -hmm. He says, it's no, not no. It's K-N-O-W, not mm -hmm. N-O. So do your homework, learn what works for you, do mushrooms by yourself, do alcohol by yourself. If you're willing to do both of those two things together, experiment. I know people that would never mix mushrooms and alcohol, especially hard alcohol. Yeah. And, and that's just because different people, different reactions. So when you reacted, when you were talking about the stomach aspects of it, mm -hmm. That was likely due to not ingesting the fruit itself. Right. Like you were just drinking the alcohol mm -hmm. and the alcohol is the extraction of it. The fruit has, um, people say that it's likely the beta glucans or these sugars that are in the mushrooms that tend to cause the stomach issues. Okay. And that that's not, I mean, that makes sense. That scans, but there hasn't been enough research to really know. And so in that way, if you know that you can separate, that's why people do teas or they do the lemon tech, you know, right. just to try to avoid that or pre-digest that. So right. as far as an alcohol tincture, I think that that's a perfectly valid method. I think that it should require a little bit more deference when looking at it because you are taking multiple things at the same time. Um, and, and so I think that it should, you, giving that a little bit of consideration should be important. Now, when it comes to like chocolates, I think chocolates are fair game. They're going to be extremely prevalent because they've always been around. As far as I've known mushrooms, they've always been like, I've always seen both fruiting bodies and chocolates. It's just been a regular thing mm -hmm. as a, because cannabis has brought gummies to the forefront and all these other things like toffees or taffies and stuff like that to the forefront. I really do see a lot of that happening within the um, mushroom space as well. And so I really want to tell people to um, be aware that, yes, gummies are great for their ease of consumption. Um, testing them, this is what I'm going to put on my testing hat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bitch. Like cannabis hasn't even figured out how to test gummies efficiently yet. <laughs> so that we're, we're, we're a number of years away from figuring that out right now. And so because of that, um, I tend to tell people to go with something that's a little bit more easily understood. Like a chocolate is something that I believe can easily be understood. Extracts are easily understood. Um, and so I think that there's space for this to understand what's going into gummies or going into chocolates, as well as maybe some of the chocolates and some of the edibles. But I'm not sure that testing the gummies themselves is going to be something we're going to be able to do. Um, but it's just me. I, I, I would love to, if somebody's figured that shit out, dude, like <laughs> more power to you. My stance is we stand on the shoulders of giants. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for a slew of different people. So if there's capacity for me utilizing my platforms to help somebody else get their work out, I'm down for it. Oh, so if I there's somebody it. in your audience that's listening, that knows shit, or that wants to share some of their insights and feels like that's being underutilized, like we're here to help bring people into the forefront, especially scientists and citizen scientists. That's awesome. You know, uh, I interviewed uh, Dana Larson here not too long ago. And yeah. he, has, he has one of the, the first uh, mushroom stores, storefronts in Vancouver. And he also is selling a coca, coca plant and coca tea. Um, do you, when you were using your, the, uh, 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 the, the, the spectrometer. Uh, yeah, HPLC, yeah. Okay, when you, HPLC, when you were using that, are you also able to uh, pick up that same type of information from, let's say, peyote or? There are a number of different things that we can utilize this system for. Um, I have yet to specifically try this method for mescaline. I have other methods that I've tested mescaline on and could easily get signal with this instrument with. Um, I'm. I would put money on, I could easily test mescaline and some of its derivatives. I definitely can test for uh, beta carbolines. I test for DMT, so I've tested ayahuasca teas. Um, there's also the capability to do testing for, um, uh, what is it, um, uh, cordycepin um, and adenosine Never from cordyceps. Those are, those are the two compounds. Um, so have you heard of cordyceps mushrooms? No. Oh, okay. So th this is a fun one. Um, okay. In the mountains of Tibet, um, there is a caterpillar that gets infected by a fungus that then tells that caterpillar to climb to the top of a, of a stalk of grass, 
clamp down and then it dies. And then out of the caterpillar's head shoots out a mushroom stalk that's just basically looks like a finger, like a brown finger, and it puts out spores. This thing is called the Ophiocordyceps. Um, and it's used by Sherpa to help them climb the Himalaya. Because uh, one of the things that it has in it are these compounds, cordycepin and adenosine, um, which if we actually take a look at um, the chemistry of how oxygen use happens in bodies, right. like in, in, in our body specifically, um, we use oxygen to produce this thing that's called ATP. It's the currency of cells. Okay. Um, it's for, short for adenosine triphosphate. Okay. So what happens is your body has stores of adenosine diphosphate, and it adds the whole process of turning oxygen into energy converts ADP into ATP. Okay. So it just basically adds on a phosphate group. But to build it, you need to have that adenosine group. So if you have more adenosine present and cordycepin, you can get more of those ATPs that then can be used by your body to help you make make you more use of oxygen so they would utilize it to help them get better oxygenation while they're climbing the himalaya wow. this was discovered that they were using these things and then there's a recent discovery it was been used in chinese medicine for hundreds of years mm. um the 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 mushroom the the cordyceps mushroom but the thing is is that it exists in a lot of different ways and there's actually an ancient chinese form of cultivation of it because it's not just a symbiotic mush i mean a parasitic mushroom that infects a caterpillar it also can grow in the ground as well and there's actually an american version uh cordyceps militaris um and the citizen scientist and good friend of mine william pandia brown who's a genius young genius in his own right he's mm -hmm. lives out in um pennsylvania has wrote written the book um about cordyceps cultivation and how you can grow it and grows it in the united states and is possibly one of the one of the largest cultivators of this mushroom in the united states and he sells it to people that put it into tons of different supplements from that are based around um increasing one's oxygen utilization like endurance it is a company yeah on, yeah on it yes. is a company that Sh shroom tech sport i believe contains cordyceps in it um, other companies that I know of, Cognitive Function, I actually have one of their, I have their Reishi Honey right here. Ooh, um, it's delicious, okay. but they also do Cordyceps Tinctures. Is that, is this, is that what's in flow? I think that's what's in flow. Let me double check. If this has Reishi, Hawthorn Berries. Yeah, flows flows just amazing. I also have a little bit of a flow from cognitive function as well. These are just okay. some of the other mushroom products that we test as well. I mean, just to mm -hmm. help people understand what's inside of them. Um, we're working out methods to help people to understand, you know, how they can dose themselves appropriately with, you know, cordyceps mushrooms, with reishi mushrooms. We want to help people that want to make um, botanical products with those things, because all of these high labs is not just psychedelic mushrooms it's mushrooms as a whole because right. there's a lot that we can learn from mushrooms they're honestly i think plants i i honestly got into mushrooms because of i'm gonna go deep here for a second that's okay tangent oh, yes. but it's not gonna be a long one Hi, Pim. um Pack in the bowl. Uh, <laughs> so I, I didn't smart I didn't start smoking weed until much later in life. I dabbled some in like my teens and, and in college times, but it wasn't until a uh, bad breakup at 23 that my brother's like, "You're not eating enough. I can guarantee you can eat." And I was like, "How are you going to do that?" It's like, "Smoke this joint." Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> "Okay." I was like, and I had an appetite, and that was it. Br brought me out of a depression, helped me start to eat again, and it was through cannabis. I was like, okay, I'm willing to try other things. So yeah. I had graduated college, and I had um, decided I was going to do mushrooms for the first time. And so I learned two very important lessons on mushrooms. I'm going to smoke first, though. Yeah, please do. Cheers. <laughs> I just got mine. <clears throat> Oh, mine. Speaking of that, I'm smoking, just in your honor, intergalactic cookies tonight. If we're going, we're going all the way out. There it is. Exactly. <laughs> going out to the stars, my friend, going out to the stars. Um, so 
<clears throat> the two lessons I learned on mushrooms were from two different experiences. One was introspective and the other was a, was a conversation. So the introspective part was me actually looking into and remembering, actually, this was on acid. The, this one was not on mushrooms, but oh, acid okay. comes from mushrooms. Uh, it's a whole different conversation, but yeah. regardless. Um, uh, it's a two. tryptamine. Is, is an, uh, LSD is a tryptamine. We'll just put it there in that category for now. Um, and that being said, um, I went back to middle school typing class. Who has typing classes anymore? Like we actually worked on typewriters in my middle school. That's how old I am. I'm showing my age. Um, but it was, it, was the, it was the late 90s. Um, and that being said, we had this uh, mock interview where I said I wanted to be a biogenetic chemist. I didn't go to college for that. I got a degree in philosophy. Um, and I remembered on acid that, that interview. And that was what I wanted to be as a kid. And I was like, why, why didn't I pursue that? So it's like, you know what? cannabis helped me get here i'm going to go back to school and i'm going to try to give back to cannabis you know i want to get i'm going to get into the cannabis industry i want to get back to this plant that gave back to me you know gave me gave me a, a lease on life again you know it's like it helped bring me out of a very dark place um and so i did that and i, I got back into school and while i was in school getting um my degree in um uh, biology uh, I was actively um, trying to expand my consciousness in more meaningful ways. And I did mushrooms. And in it, I had a conversation with a tree in my backyard, a holly tree specifically. And it taught me the most important lesson I learned in my life. Mm -hmm. And that was that it was an equation and it was a cyclical equation and it was a presentation of ideas. But I distill it down to the statement that life equals energy equals information equals life equals energy equals information and the way that kind of interpreted for me was it was very much a as above so below conversation of micro to macro mm -hmm. i'll start at just the micro level and i'll show you the path to the macro and hopefully it i don't have to go into it too deeply but it should lead to it yeah. um if we look at uh i think about the fundamental building blocks of our universe you know it's like we can talk about atoms we can talk about quarks for all intents and purposes but mm -hmm. let's just talk about it basically in the form of charge okay so we have um if we think about uh, a a graph we can think about what we call a sine wave so something that starts out at zero goes up to one goes back down to zero goes to negative one and goes to zero so it just it's a sine wave okay so yeah. neutral, positive, neutral, negative, okay? Mm -hmm. And that sine wave, that fluctuation, that's energy, okay? That, that, that whole wave. But if you choose a point on that wave, like when it is positive, when it is neutral, when it is negative, that's information. We're talking about the same thing, just at different scales. So that's the same thing when we're talking about um, when Einstein says collapsing the wave equation, we're talking about a photon of light can be both a, a, a physical object, a particle, and a wave, because we're talking about its fluctuation states, also where it's at at a specific time. So when we're talking about the building blocks of our universe, we have neutrons, protons, and electrons. Those things interact with each other, those energy states as they fluctuate, as well as information states, as they are at single points, interact with each other to create everything in our universe. They create atoms, and then atoms interact with each other to create molecules. Molecules interact with each other to create building blocks of organelles. Organelles build with each other to create multicellular organisms. Multicellular organisms expands into uh, tribes. Tribes expand into cultures. Cultures expand into religions. Religions expand into nations. Nations expand into companies. Companies expand into something. Don't know. Mm -hmm. And then we get to this Gaia state where everybody is uh, an understanding that all life is the same. We're just mm -hmm. looking at it at different scales. And then we can also look at the solar system, heliosphere, in the same way. Like Earth wouldn't exist the way it is if it wasn't for Jupiter sucking in tons of meteors that would have pummeled us into oblivion. Right. It's like that interaction is just like how your liver is filtering out toxins when you drink, <laughs> when you drink alcohol. <laughs> same thing. It's same thing. It's like 
dumb planet trying to grow life in this meteor ridden atmosphere gotta take up all these fucking meteors yeah you know, it's like dumb person drinking all this alcohol i gotta filter out all this out it's the same kind of idea if we expand out so that's the lesson that i learned yeah. all life is energy all energy is information all information is life and we're talking about the same things just different perspectives or as i also like to say um the universe is a multifaceted gem that we're all looking at it from different perspectives mm -hmm. but the the thing is we are the gem looking at itself and so it's this unique way and like you are the facets looking mm -hmm. at itself like you can mm -hmm. see other facets sometimes you can understand your own self but sometimes other people see you better than you see yourself and that's this whole process of because it's the universe seeing it's the universe being together and seeing the works that they do. I, I checked out a couple of your different podcasts. That's one of the reasons why I was okay doing this. Yeah, like I see the work that you put in and mm -hmm. I, I, that's why I appreciate it. And I, that's why I wanted to do it. Much respect. You know, how does the metaverse factor into that? Hmm, good question. So I really feel like that the metaverse is going to be it's going to be an aspect if there's going to if we're going to stay on this path that we are on this technological path that we are on like heaven forbid um something derails us like a meteor you know the jupiter thing you know um <laughs> if we stay on this path i do believe that one of the best depictions of what a possible future could be it's not positive it's dystopian and that's ready player one yeah. I think that's that's kind of the space that people are going to start investing into these things. They're going to there's there's an article, I think, uh, that exists. Um, you're not going to own anything. You're going to live in a pod and you're going to like and you're going to eat bugs and you're going to like it mm -hmm. or in this some kind of thing. And it's like it's I don't know if it's satire or if it's real anymore, just because what what the world we're living in. But it's going to basically boil down to people. I mean, there's this whole tiny home movement. People are moving away from owning yeah. physical lands or or properties. And it's like or living in apartments or renting. It's like you people don't own much anymore, like as individuals, like mm -hmm. specific people do. And so in this way, this idea of real estate or virtual real estate that somebody can own that could literally just be taken away at the drop of a hat. To me, it's a tough investment for a lot of people that grew up before the Internet to make. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the division I make. It's like I'm, I'm that generation. Like I grew up like the Internet didn't really take its stride until the 90s. You know, it, it got its stride with like AOL kind of bringing it to the people, as it were. And after that, um, I believe that people have a lot more faith in the longevity of the internet. But those mm -hmm. of us that lived without it know that there's a possibility that it's not going to always be there. And investing into that, it's it can be very, very risky because we understand that just because you know that the internet hasn't always been there doesn't mean everybody else does. Like there have been people like... I think about it this way, like every dog that you and I have met just this year, we've been alive their whole life. Like they don't, there has not been, there's not a dog older than you or I, to my mm -hmm. knowledge. Yeah. And, and so it's just like thinking about generations, it's the same way. It's like, there are more people alive now that don't know what a world without the internet is like, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, then yeah. there are than there were before that. I think yeah. it's kind of a weird place to be in. And I think that's something that we need to really acknowledge as we're in the nascency or the infancy of the information age still. Like we don't know, social media is an experiment. Honestly, I think it's a misnomer. I think it's anti-social media. <laughs> um, I think that actually does more to damage us than it does to, to help us in some ways. But it's, I think that has more to do with the fact that it's a double-edged sword. Like right. it's, it's all about the handling of it. If you know mm -hmm. how to handle it, well, it can create great communities. But mm -hmm. if it's not handled well, or it's being used intentionally badly, which it can be done, mm -hmm. it's very dangerous. And that's the space that we know that there needs to be a little bit more understanding. And I think that when it comes to the metaverse, specifically to your question, <laughs> um, I'm hesitant. I'm really hesitant because I know the power of, as I said before, the human brain is a transceiver. It both sends and receives chemical signals. Mm -hmm. Well, the way eyes work and ears work is we're taking um, uh, photons 
and audio waves. So two different light waves and audio waves, essentially two different stimuli. And we're converting those into chemical signals that the brain then runs through its consciousness filter, which okay. is what I would argue is what you would argue with me makes up the thoughts that you think of as you, your mm -hmm. conscious self, as well as all the unconscious stuff that exists as your biology. Okay. Um, that once it filters through that, that comes into what you perceive as reality. And so if you could manipulate, like I know for a fact, like I've experienced like Oculus with the whale, like the, the, it, I, 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 I have thalassophobia to some degree, like, and that scares me. Like mm -hmm. that's creepy to know that that thing is that big and it's right next to me. It scares me, you know? That's, that's very good to know because, you know, I open each one of my shows with some sort of a scene. I already have one planned for your show. So, it, <laughs> a, but, but, but I'm gonna, there will be no whales involved or any animals involved. I appreciate in it. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And, so it's that, it, it's that kind of space. I feel that and I know how, how impactful that can be. So when we're talking about other realities through Oculus and all these other spaces i want to make sure that we're not um putting ourselves in another mk ultra space where it's a double-edged sword we don't know what we're, what's happening people can be manipulated but because if you give somebody enough entheogens and put them in a, and put them in a uh, a different reality space like that seems like a very risky thing so it's like poly drugging <laughs> like i was saying earlier it's like that's something i think is dangerous and i don't think we should necessarily push onto people as a entry level thing like that's that's right. advanced work that's like yeah. you're not gonna say um to a kid okay kid get out there and play in this championship wrestling match without first teaching them how to wrestle you know it's like that's yes. not the play you know it's like you gotta you gotta teach people the fundamentals mm -hmm. of how to explore themselves who they are what ego loss feels like as well as you know it's like one of my uh i have a clip that exists online um it's a it's it's a video of it, it exists in my head rent free to this day because I think this is literally what DMT is and let's not forget psilocybin is a DMT uh, a sister of DMT. Right. Um, it's one guy uh, talking to another guy and he says, "Hey man, what you doing? Uh, I'm talking to God." And then the other guy's like, "Is he telling you to kill everybody?" The guy's like, "Yeah." He's like, "No, that's not God. That's Satan." Hi, Satan. And then the, then the, the then you hear back in this like echoey voice, hi boys. It's like <laughs> that to me is the DMT space. It's like it, it exists. It's just like it's there. You know, oh it's like and you just gotta be recognizing what it is. You know, that's that's the space. You just gotta put in the protections, know what you're getting into. But that that exists rent-free in my head. It's a and it's funny thing is it's actually depicted as little mushroom people. So it's even funnier because the Satan mushrooms, this giant thing with like a mouth running down its stipe. It's crazy. Crazy. It's creepy. It's cool. It's very I psychedelic. It. I love it. That to me is like that's psychedelics in a nutshell. It's like there's a danger here. You just got to be aware of the warning signs. It's like, is he telling you to kill everybody? Yeah. No, that's not God. That's Satan. Does the psilocybin cup have? Are you? Do you guys have like a Discord uh, set up for? Uh we not yet. We have our uh, Patreon set up. It's going to be part of the Patreon membership. We're going to okay. be having our Patreon membership, have access to it here in a bit. Um, we have the uh, Hyphae Labs uh, Patreon set up right now. We do have the ability to accept patrons, but we haven't really had the ability to put into our content because of the cup and everything like that. The conference and the cup right now has been so big for us. And right. we are a very small team. And so we're actually working to bring in more people to help us expand. We actually have a very close group of people that we've brought in. I'm really excited to see what this next uh what the fall brings the fall is going to be banging right so you guys do two a year right is there one that's better yeah. or different than because i i've read in, as far as mushrooms growing that mushrooms mm -hmm. that grow in the fall and the 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 winter are better grows is that is that true in general well, a lot of the work that we see coming in has been indoor work. There has been some outdoor work. Um, that being said, mushroom turnaround time is much shorter. Like you could get go from spores to fruit within a month, yeah. you know. So doing work in that way, um, we wanted to allow, again, because the cup is here for the community. It's like a platform to highlight who's doing the work, who's producing what, and, you know, it allows for harm reduction, so people know how to dose themselves appropriately. That's the whole goal, is to really provide, again, at least a point to start. You know, it's like, 
okay, so the potency range is in the microdosing range typically for this thing. Okay, I can expect that if I grow this on my own, I can use it for microdosing. Or if, you know, I'm growing this, it's like, it, this isn't meant for like big companies. Like, yeah, sure, big companies want to do takeaways from it. That's fine. I'm trying to speak to the people that are trying to grow their own medicine. So they have information available to them. It's like, like oh, a lot of the people that we have aren't just cultivators. They are um, uh, um, like, um, they are cultivators, but I'm not like in the sense that they're that not many people do it. They do it for the scientific research purposes. They're trying to produce or get to genetics reasons. You are know what I'm any, saying? Are there any and retail? So, are there any retail uh, facilities for mushrooms yet in California anywhere? Like like what Dana's doing up in uh, um. So like what Dana's doing? No, short answer. Long answer is there is a place you can go in, exchange Federal Reserve notes for Monopoly money, and then turn that Monopoly money into mushrooms. Ah, that's beautiful. Okay. So that exists. There, yeah. There's a place where that can happen. Okay. I mean, I say it that way to protect the innocent. Sure. Okay. So the, and the same as it is everywhere else. <laughs> there's a, there's a way in. America no, no, no. I mean, there, no, there, there's a, there's a, there's definitely a, I mean, they've been raided. Um, yeah. And, but nothing has come of it. Like no, mm -hmm. no charges have been ridden. Like, and so right. it's at this point within, within the Oakland space, I know mm -hmm. that that exists. Um, I don't know if it exists in like Santa Cruz where it's also decriminalized mm -hmm. um, or Arcata where it's also decriminalized. I don't right. know if those things have happened yet. Um, but I do know that there's a large push for communities to really grow into the decriminalization space. Um, the Bay Area is a lot more resistant. Uh, Berkeley was very resistant. Um, Richmond's open to it, but it's still kind of resistant. Um, Emeryville is very resistant. And so it's like certain places or things like, uh, you know, James McConkey doing work yeah. with decrim SF. Yeah. Um, I know they have their own barriers that they're trying to hurdle, but I mean, if there's anybody to do it, he's the one to do it. Yeah. So as it stands like i mean there's people out here doing the work for a, a normal average everyday mushroom user is there any tells common tells that they can do when they're looking at both fresh mushrooms and dried mushrooms to know if there's something off or wrong so that they would not and is there any is there and i know we're talking about all these different types of of, of cultivars which i know is mm -hmm. where i'm making it a broad spectrum but um mm. is there is there like i saw i'll give you an example i saw some mushrooms not long ago that were uh black um on the bottom they were very thin and it looked to me like they had not been dried properly and it had a little head on it and a bit long spit and it was it it looked wrong uh just mm. in general but i was wondering mm. is there other than something that would be that obvious is there something else uh, that might be a tell so there are some things i can recommend looking at um if it's fresh um the blackening blackening so if it's like non uh cubensis so if like if it was maybe like uh, I'm trying to think of something that would have that kind of color. An azure essence would kind of like bruise very, very black where it's cut. Like it would okay. bruise, it would bruise blue, 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 black. So maybe that could have been a thing. Like it could have been a non-cubensis and mm -hmm. it could be that the coloring maybe have been off in that way. And the bruising can be a little bit more indicative of it's not might not have been a large mushroom. And because it was so small, the potency relative to its mass was high. And that's I would go to black um, yeah. could be a reason because there are other mushrooms that are known for that like um, I mean some of the mushrooms though uh, there's a gentleman Jordan Jacobs that also does um, testing um, he's tested I believe it was Azure Essence that tested higher than anything we had submitted to the cup Whoa. so it and it by mass like and so that's something that's important to note that these things exist in other species right you know and well, so, mine looked, mine and looked is, like uh, the broomstick from the Wicked Witch of the West is what it looked like after, after you know, it was, it was, had completely, uh, after, after it had been burnt, <laughs> it was, it didn't yeah, yeah, look yeah, correct yeah, yeah. at all. It, it was just, it was wrong. I, I don't think that I turned down something that was truly incredible <laughs> at this. Fair, time. fair, fair. I mean, I would, 
I would tell people to avoid like I've seen people submit things that are questionable like if they have if any mushroom ever has a gloss like a dried mushroom has a glossy surface on it mm -hmm. or anything like that that could be indicative of either um, so them spraying something for preservative purposes which might not be good for you or it could be um, a, a dried biofilm from other organisms mm -hmm. so I would tell you to not always t trust something like that alternatively um, I would also point towards um, the if you see fuzziness on any dried mushroom um dried mushroom specifically fuzziness can be indicative of uh new infections onto the mushroom not necessarily mushroom growth itself mm -hmm. um i would especially on dried mushrooms because the mushroom itself wouldn't have any cellular activity the stuff it would basically just be food at that point um, especially with free dry freeze dried to bring back to the freeze dried conversation okay. um freeze dried um are so dry that most things wouldn't be able to colonize like most other fungi wouldn't be able to colonize it no. or bacteria would be able to colonize it but there's still a chance that if it does get colonized and you store it in a cool dark space and it's not like dry 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 that there's a chance that you're going to actually have degradation of the mushroom um that that organism might do might break it down mm -hmm. um so Always look for fuzziness on dried fruit um, as an indi indication of contamination. Um, other colors, green is very rarely seen on cubensis as a color and can be indicative of, um, I would avoid uh, substrate. Most, most fruit that have substrate attached to them, I would separate substrate from the fruit as quickly as possible, just because the okay. substrate can have organisms in it yep. on top of the fact that it's not good for consumption. Okay. Um, so I would always wanna separate fruit from substrate um as quickly as possible before drying preferably and then rinsing in between mm -hmm. but again it comes down to you don't want to overhandle because overhandling can cause bruising and so there's trade-offs as to how to do it best um i also recommend that when people harvest if you do harvest i recommend harvesting at low temperatures um like actually chilling the room while you do it Whoa. because you want to slow down the metabolism of the organisms um as you're doing it and that can actually reduce the amount of bluing and that can also reduce the amount of other organisms living in the final in the final space like you're you're trying to basically um put it into hibernation as you as you mm -hmm. harvest it wow i've never heard so, that before uh, that's really cool that's a great one yeah yeah killer tip yeah. okay well i'm going to put up on uh, all the information on on psilocybin cup and uh people can attend yeah. us right they're able to come and and see some of the so uh, the conference so let me tell you about the differences what we're going to do in the fall and the spring so okay. the spring is the spring and the fall are always going to have a cup with the cup we always do a conference so in the spring um last year we did a digital conference this year we we decided we're going to do what's called the california psychedelic conference so somewhere in california we're going to have this year we did it in la we're mm -hmm. going to have a psychedelic conference for the whole state and then in the mm -hmm. fall we're going to do the oakland psychedelic conference okay. and so that being said there's always going to be a, a, an event for people to come and attend so if you're interested um where we post the data oakland hyphae 510 that's going to be um both uh hyphae events as well as hyphae labs those we're going to be able to find information about both of those fantastic. the testing the cup and the conference fantastic and you are on which social networks are you still enjoying if somebody so the only you. social networks um uh, the only social networks that i personally utilize is instagram you can find me at um at i psychonaut e y e psychonaut p s y c h o n a u t um you can reach us at hyphae labs um at, that's at h y p h a e labs l a b s um on instagram or if you want to reach out to um, the events and catch up with those you can follow us at oakland underscore hyphae outstanding dude i you you answered all my questions i think i've got most of them uh uh clarified i definitely now understand the the spreadsheet much better and uh i'm Dope. excited to see what happens this year and and the next opportunity i get back i'm going to try and come to one of the cups and uh and, and i absolutely can, keep me posted i i, I want to be uh i want to be in charge of samples sample me here let me try this <laughs> one i'm like mikey let me try it i'll try anything <laughs> i will i will state one of the more um uh powerful things is since we have all this data 
Um, our goal is to actually put it into the hands of therapists to yeah. hopefully allow them to be able to, because one, it's like one of the hardest things therapists do is they, is get reasonable product. Like that's hard to do. And, but at the same time, if we um, can provide this for therapists as another form of harm reduction, so they don't put themselves at risk um, and we can just be like, this is you know donated to you. Like this is, there's no charge here. I think that that's a space for us to then also ask them to give us any information that they have. Like if they're, if their person's willing to tell us, you know, their thoughts or their experience, we can, we can take that and we can take that anecdotal data. And I'm a data scientist. I'm actually getting my master's in data scientists simultaneous to all of this. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm actively um, engaged in natural language processing. You know, it's like where we can actually take you know um, anecdotal evidence, like people's statements of experience, and get sentiment analysis. What was it? Did they feel it was beneficial? Did they not like it? Did they feel it was scary? Like they felt it was smooth? You know, all these different things. I could we can gather that like word clouds and try to generate for um, specific um, uh, different cultivars maybe some of that information that can then be provided back to the community as harm reduction wow killer karma all the way around everybody's helping each other that's, that's what it's the goal about. i mean it, it's it's the uh, i like i always every time i've done a job interview i've always referenced the offers and i'll leave it at this i always try to go for the three-way win you know, it's like the thing that's like the impossible thing that Michael Scott's like, oh, no, we can choose this one. It's like you actually have to work for it. You don't just choose it. But the way I see it is um, I used to wait tables. So the three way in this in waiting tables, if the customer comes in, they leave happy and full. That means they enjoyed themselves. They ate a lot of food. They ate a lot of food. The, the, the restaurant wins. They enjoyed themselves. They'll come back. The restaurant wins. Okay, the customer wins because they got a bang in experience and felt like they got bang for the buck. I win because I get paid based off of how well they enjoyed themselves and how much they spent. So it's like our, our all the goals kind of align. It's just, it makes sure trying to get that three-way win to line up. This is what I'm trying to do here. It's like, I want the community to win. I want therapists to win. I want patients to win. And this is how we can kind of feed that together in a meaningful way. I love it, dude. And you're breaking new ground and the, you know, forevermore, the, 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 the psilocybin cup is, uh, is, is, it's got a home right there and you demand. I'm very, I'm very thankful to be a part of it. I'm honored to have been able to be a part, like literally the science backbone. Um, it's been really tough on my brain to be able to learn this because this isn't <laughs> my background. Yeah. But I've had a community of people get me here. Again, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Thanks, Captain, for providing me the opportunity to share not just myself, my perspective, but also your platform. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, my friend. And I will hope to have you back again because I've already got about three or four or 5,000 other questions here for you. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> I'll see you next Be time. Be safe, stay healthy. Thank mm, you, and to your audience too. Be safe, stay healthy. Welcome back, everyone. Holy cow. This is freaking amazing. Personally, I can't wait to get down to San Francisco to go to one of these psilocybin cups. I think I learned more about magic mushrooms in this interview than I knew in my entire life. Wow. Huge props and thanks again to Ian. Really appreciate you coming in. All right, everyone. Enjoy the rest of this psychedelic experience, and we will see you on Wednesday with a brand new Wake and Bake. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, baby. Look at this.
Hey, look, it's my new house. How amazing is that? All right, everyone. See you next time. <laughs> it's Captain Hooter.